Hi everyone. Today we'll be looking at another horrible case with you. This is a chilling crime story from Christchurch, New Zealand. It's about two young women named Tisha Lowry and Rebecca Chamberlain. They were both caught up in a terrible series of events that ended their lives far too soon. Tisha was a kind-hearted and lively 28-year-old, loved by everyone who knew her. But one day in 2008, she disappeared without a trace, leaving her family and friends worried sick. Meanwhile, just a couple of houses away, Rebecca, a loving wife and mother, found herself in a frightening situation that would also lead to tragedy. In this episode, we'll uncover the heartbreaking stories of Tisha and Rebecca. So let's start. On September 26, 2008, Tisha Lowry, a vibrant 28-year-old woman, had spent some quality time with her grandfather at the Bower Tavern in Christchurch. She was looking forward to celebrating his birthday the next day. Recently, Tisha had moved in with her grandfather to take a break from her 48-year-old boyfriend and reflect on their relationship issues. That Thursday morning, Tisha left the tavern to return home. Little did she know that it would be the last time she'd be seen alive. She didn't show up for her grandfather's birthday celebration the next day, which raised concerns among her family members, especially her mother, Tanya. Tanya, troubled by Tisha's absence, reached out to her boyfriend, only to discover that he hadn't seen or heard from Tisha for days. Panic set in, prompting the family to contact the police and report Tisha missing on October 2nd, 2008. Detective Senior Sergeant Virginia Labaz made a public plea for information a week after Tisha's disappearance, and the investigation intensified. The police searched Tisha's grandfather's house and other places she frequented. Community members distributed flyers and joined the search efforts, hoping to find any clues or witnesses. Despite the involvement of 35 officers and extensive searches, Tisha remained missing, leaving the community deeply troubled and desperate for answers. The search efforts expanded to the Avon River, a scenic spot where Tisha might have taken on her way home from the tavern. Eight months later, on the 11th of June, 2009, the police released a statement that there was now a reward for any information on the whereabouts of Tisha Lowry. As the days turned into weeks and the weeks into months, the community's hope of finding Tisha alive began to fade. Yet, they remained determined to uncover the truth and bring closure to Tisha's family and friends. One year after Tisha's disappearance, in around mid of November, Christchurch police received a call from a man named Jason Somerville stating that his wife had not returned home after setting out for church at 10.30. Police spoke with him, and he said he felt the fact she left her keys was out of character. Her handbag, cell phone, and bank cards were also left, and he stated she was a recovering alcoholic with a history of self-harm who was on antidepressants. On September 2nd, Police contacted him, and he stated there was no sign of his wife. The day after, he went to his local police station to report that he had found his wife's glasses and wedding ring had been posted through his letterbox overnight. However, his demeanor and subsequent actions raised suspicion among investigators. During questioning, Somerville stunned detectives by admitting to killing both Tisha and Rebecca. His confession revealed chilling details about the crimes that sent shivers down the spines of those involved in the case and the wider community. Somerville described the events leading up to Tisha's murder on September 25, 2008. On that day, sometime between 11 a.m. and 12.30 p.m., Jason Somerville is home alone at his house. Then, he suddenly hears someone was, was knocking at the front door. When he opened the door, it was wearing a Chicago Bulls jacket and jeans. It would seem that Tisha had been to Jason's house previously, but what she had come over for this day is unknown. Jason allowed Tisha into the house. She started playing with the computer. He became increasingly angry when she refused to leave despite his commands. In a fit of rage, he pushed her down the stairs. Then, he choked Tisha until she couldn't breathe anymore. Then, he saw a lot of blood come out of her mouth. After that, he put his wife's underwear down Tisha's throat. He took off Tisha's pants and underwear and raped her lifeless body. 
After that, he hid her body under the stairs in the house. Somerville had to leave for a meeting, so he cleaned up the house to hide what he did. When his wife, Rebecca, came back, she didn't know what happened. He went to sleep like normal, but Tisha's body was under the house. The next day, Somerville went under the house and raped her body again. Then, he dug a hole and buried her there. After that, he acted like everything was normal. The details of Rebecca's murder were equally disturbing. On a typical Sunday morning, Jason Somerville tried to have sex with his wife, Rebecca, but she said no. He then went downstairs and drank a cup of coffee. And after he came back from downstairs, he again asked her, but she refused. This made Jason angry, so he grabbed her by the neck and choked her until she passed out. He thought she would be okay when he let go, but she didn't wake up. Jason realized she was dead, so he made sure she wouldn't wake up by pressing on her neck. He then put underwear in her mouth and raped her body. After that, he panicked and hid her body under the stairs in their house, just like he did with Tisha's body. He covered her with dirt and tried to act like nothing happened. Somerville's cold and calculated descriptions of the murders left investigators and the community reeling with horror and disbelief. His lack of remorse or empathy for his victims underscored the depth of his depravity and sent a chilling reminder of the dangers lurking within seemingly ordinary neighborhoods. Jason Somerville's troubled past is marked by a history of violence and criminal behavior, providing insight into his potential motives for the murders of Tisha Laurie and Rebecca Chamberlain. Born on January 20, 1976, in Christchurch, New Zealand, Somerville faced significant challenges from a young age. Growing up, Somerville experienced instability due to his parents' divorce when he was just 13 years old. He moved with his mother and siblings to Topo, where financial struggles persisted despite his mother's involvement in the Mormon church. Somerville's difficulties extended into his schooling years, where he faced bullying and was perceived as slow by his peers. His reactions to bullying sometimes turned violent, and he developed troubling behaviors such as stealing women's underwear and peeping into windows. Despite warnings from local authorities, Somerville's criminal behavior escalated, with instances of burglary and stalking women. He was prescribed medication for epilepsy, which he claimed helped control his mood swings, but his erratic and violent tendencies continued unchecked. Somerville's relationships were also fraught with instability and substance abuse. His marriage to Rebecca Chamberlain was marred by financial struggles, substance abuse issues, and allegations of domestic violence. Despite attempts to regain custody of their children, Somerville and Chamberlain were deemed unfit parents, further exacerbating their turmoil. Psychologically, Somerville's behavior reflects a troubled individual with deep-seated issues. His violent outbursts, lack of remorse, and disturbing fantasies suggest underlying psychological disturbances that may have contributed to his homicidal actions. While no formal diagnosis has been provided, his pattern of behavior aligns with traits of psychopathy, characterized by a lack of empathy, impulsivity, and manipulative tendencies. Following Jason Somerville's confession to the murders of Tisha Lowry and Rebecca Chamberlain, Legal proceedings commenced with his trial. The prosecution presented compelling evidence, including Somerville's detailed confession and forensic findings linking him to the crimes. Witnesses testified to Somerville's erratic behavior and history of violence, painting a damning picture of the defendant. After deliberation, the court delivered its verdict, finding Somerville guilty of both murders. The judge sentenced him to life imprisonment, with a minimum term of 23 years. Despite Somerville's claims of remorse, the court deemed him a significant risk to society, citing the impulsive and violent nature of his crimes. A poem which Rebecca Chamberlain had written shortly before she was murdered titled I Am Not a Mistake was read in court. A statement from Rebecca Chamberlain's mother was read in court that said she has had trouble sleeping and there were days in which she could not stop crying. Rebecca's father had a statement read on his behalf. I really miss Rebecca and feel lost without her in my life. Tisha Lowry and Rebecca Chamberlain's bodies were removed on the night of the 7th of September, 2009. 
Crowds of people had come out to watch the removal, including members of Tisha Lowry's family. Her mother, Tanya Lowry, embraced relatives in tears as Tisha's body was carried past her and placed into a hearse. In the aftermath of the murders, calls for reform echoed throughout the community, urging authorities to address systemic shortcomings in the response to domestic violence. Advocates called for increased resources for victim support services, improved law enforcement training, and greater awareness of the warning signs of abusive behavior. The tragedy sparked a renewed commitment to protecting vulnerable individuals and holding perpetrators accountable for their actions. As we end our documentary, we remember Tisha Laurie and Rebecca Chamberlain, whose lives were taken by Jason Somerville. Their stories show how dangerous domestic violence can be. And that's all for today. Subscribe to our channel and comment down below if any true crime case you want me to cover. And give your suggestions on how should I improve my videos.